Do you remember the moment you saw her? Oh, yeah. When our eyes met, and it was not a hatred, it was a compassion look. Because I've already been explaining to the rest of the people, not knowing she's standing over there, what, that he was the true hero, not me. You know, I can still see his pupils. I can still see life in him. And when I say I feel like I saw his soul, like I saw the, the you know, the last speck of light in his eyes. So yeah, it was just like a, like a connection I couldn't explain. I feel like also so much was communicated in that split second. It's, it's like a, it was really like a, um, just like a one moment connection. What you're about to hear is a story of bravery, sacrifice, honor, and gratitude. It's a story that captures three different moments belonging to three very different people and how their lives will be forever intertwined. I'm Katie Mahalik, and you're listening to Shadow Clock. Ted Wallace had been going to the U.S. Virgin Islands since 1977, and from his very first moment on St. Croix, he fell in love with it, enough to go back every chance he got. I still love going there, the, uh, the aqua blues and, of course, the great weather, and, of course, I substitute teach down there, too. So, Ted has been teaching most of his life, but his career path is speckled with detours and eccentricities that are unexpected. He went to Eastern Michigan University and put himself through college while working as a custodian 40 hours a week. After graduating, he taught elementary school for the next 22 years while also taking up politics, doing two stints as the mayor of South Lyon, Michigan, the first term between 1985 and 89. Back then in the 80s, they paid 200 bucks a year. To be mayor. So for 67 cents a day, I was the mayor. Did you have a gavel? I did. Oh, did I have to use it? Yes, I did. I had to ask about the gavel. I've always kind of wanted one. I was the mayor in two different millenniums. (laughs) 1985 to 89, and then also 09 to 15. It's during Ted's second term as mayor that this story takes place. It was March 1st, 2015. His wife had already headed back to the States for work, and Ted was finishing up the last few weeks of his trip by himself. On this particular day, he headed down to the Renaissance St. Croix Carambola Beach Resort and Spa to boogie board, a hobby he had picked up while vacationing. For those of you who don't know what boogie boarding is, I'll let Ted explain. A boogie board is a board of about three feet long. It's, you kind of tuck it under your belly and uh, you catch it. You go out about chest deep in the water. And when a certain wave comes in, about every seventh or eighth wave is usually the good one. You jump and catch it and you can ride it on into the beach. I have to admit, as Ted sat across from me in his blue Caribbean shirt that was splashed with drawings of palm trees and native dancers, I had a hard time imagining him on a boogie board. Though it's not necessarily hard, it's definitely something you don't see the average 60-plus-year-old doing out on their own. With Ted's white hair and typical not-so-fit American physique, it was tempting to smile as I envisioned him hitting the surf. Yet, as he talked about his boogie board and riding in on the waves, there was no denying the glint in his eye. He truly loved it. It's a good exercise. Even though at the time I was 63 years old, I just felt that I just enjoy it. That same day, a man named Bale Shabaka Kaza Amlak was out on the water skimboarding. Ted stopped to watch Bale standing on the small board that glided across the water's surface as it was propelled by the breaking waves. Before I let you get to know Bale a little better, I should mention that I'm speaking with him via Skype from where he now lives in New York City you might hear some sirens or background noise and some less than stellar audio recording. That being said, the best way for me to introduce Bale is to let you hear Ted's description of him, followed by Bale's reaction to what Ted had to say. Well, on the beach was this native of the island. He'd grown up there. He's 25, buff, in shape, masseuse, yoga instructor. He's actually, he is, I don't know if you heard the term Rastavarian. He literally grew up in the rainforest. His mother had 10 children. (laughs) (laughs) I don't consider myself a yoga master, but some look at me and think that. (laughs) After getting to know Bale, I totally got Ted's all-like description of him, as Bale is pretty much one of a kind. 
Bale said he and his siblings always knew their upbringing was out of the ordinary and that no matter where they were living, they felt different, like they stuck out. Even in the Caribbean, like people have regular, not regular names, but names that are more American. <laughs> and so it was always like, ooh, like those are some interesting names, you know what I mean? And so as kids, and we were always like, like we used to have long dreadlocks. Like, like the hair that we were born with was on our head. <laughs> I remember as children, people would always want to take photographs of us. And my parents would be like, no, like you didn't ask permission. You cannot take photographs of my parents, of my children or of us. You know what I mean? The best way to I have to show you a photograph. Give me, let, me, let me show you. Bali and his siblings had these long and beautiful locks that represented the Rastafarian background, as did their names. Bali's parents chose names that were Ethiopian names, a way of connecting their children to their African identity rather than giving the kids traditional American names or a last name that would have been the name of their descendant slave owners. Between Bale's and Ted's vastly different but both very unique lives, it seemed only fitting that their paths were destined to cross. However, at the time of their first meeting, neither of them had any idea they were about to meet again in a matter of moments. So I was uh, on the beach there, and all of a sudden the gray clouds came in, and it was unusual to see it all gray. You just, it's the land of so many blues, you just didn't, and you don't see this very often. It was all gray, and it was drizzly, and all the people on the beaches that were staying there at that place had all gone off to their cabins and so forth, and I just, for some reason, I don't know what, maybe I just stuck it out, and after about a half hour, it all cleared up and was blue again. And I decided, well, I'm going to go out boogie boarding. Well, the one time I'm doing this, all of a sudden it's something very abnormal took place where this, the whole bay lifted. The, the two, the whole, it was two forces came in each side into the bay, a huge wave in, but then it came back as a riptide and caught me and just was sweeping me out to sea. There was another man in the water that day, Sven Hill Madsen, a man from Denmark. The first time Ted called over to him for help, he didn't respond. Ted, now getting sucked out further, began to panic. He was probably 30, 40 yards from me, but he, he was my last hope before I was going to be swept around to the far side of the rocks. Ted yelled out again, as loud as he could. And this time, Mr. Madsen heard him. He signaled that he heard my call for help, and he swam to me. And he, didn't, he was a big man, magnificent uh, uh, man, size man. You know, Danes seem to be that way. And uh, he swam right up to me, and I said, why don't you hook on the end of the board with me? We'll try to paddle out together. And he comes around. He pins my arm down to make sure I'm secure and safe, too. And we start to kick and go. So you were able to talk to each other? I talked to him, but he never had talked. He didn't talk back to me. Um, he didn't answer me. He just answered my what my wish was, let's try this, you know. So uh, we start to go, and he kicks me. And I turn to say to him, oh, not that way, because they would take us back towards the rocks. And he was sucked down and gone. And I instantly knew something wasn't right, but I, I couldn't, I didn't know how I could save him. I didn't know where he was. Not only was there no sign of Mr. Madsen, but Ted was now being swept around the edge of the rocky coast, a coast made up of huge, sharp, jagged boulders. If the current took Ted around that edge, he would be completely out of sight from anyone on the beach who still might be able to see him. I'm now I'm really being swept. I know I'm headed for a crash landing into the mountainside on the other side there. As the second current swept Ted farther away, suddenly Mr. Madsen surfaced. And he's facing away from me. And I thought, oh, you decided to, to swim to the rocks. And, uh, but I don't have time to deal with it. Oh, if you got your mission, fine. I got to do something in a while. Now I'm being caught into this other current that's always there. I knew about that current because in, over the years I'd warned people, get away from there now, you know, kind of thing. And I just couldn't get out of it. The waves keep, the overall force of the other waves are just pushing me back towards the far side where there wasn't anybody. With the sharp rocks pointing their slick, serrated edges toward Ted and Mr. Madsen far out of reach, seemingly doing what he needed to do for himself, Ted had to make a split-second decision. Should he try to let the waves send him into the rocks, feet first or head first? 
And uh, now, I was just at the last second, I decided that I would, uh, instead of going in uh, head first, I was gonna go in head first and try to grab the rocks when I got there. I decided to go in feet first. And as soon as I hit, I catapult. The whole force of the wave goes up and it slams my body against the rocks. And at the last split second, the board, which was still in my hands, lifted just in time so my head cracked down onto the board instead of the rocks. And then I was stunned, obviously, but not I wasn't split open. But uh, I was uh, then sucked down underneath, every bit as deep as uh, 15 feet underwater at least. I still have my board. And I'm swirling around and, and it's out of, totally out of control. But then it would spit me out into a docile area and then the board would take over and I'd pop up. I'd get a breath of air, maybe two, before the next wave was taking me and let's do that again. And smash, and so I was in this giant washing machine, machine being swirled around. And as I quickly, the realization has hit me that I'm not getting out of this. I am going to, I'm going to die. Back on the beach, Bale had come out of the water. He was sitting there with his wife and stepchildren. Suddenly had this premonition, go climb the cliff at the end. At the end of the beach was this cliff that goes, it was the base of the mountain, just goes up. So you're telling me he couldn't see. He did not know. He has this premonition. Yes, he just has this thing hit him. You got to climb the cliff now. I have to admit, I'm always a sucker for the supernatural. And I was really excited to talk to Bale about this premonition. However, Bali didn't explain his premonition quite the same way Ted did. Well, first of all, before I went to the, before I climbed there, I've done it many times, but at the time when I did it, I felt a very strong urge to go there. Once I decided I was going to go there, I was like, like nothing was going to stop me. It was like, I just went with a very swift pace and not knowing what I was going to see. One of the things that I remember was that um, there was a couple standing at the, at the foot of the rocks where I started to climb. And then I'm a polite person. For some reason, I totally disregarded the fact that they were taking a picture. I just, I just went by. I was like, chop, 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 chop. I was like, okay, I got to get there. And once I got there, I knew why. I understood why I had to get there. When you stood up to even go that direction, did you like say to yourself, something like, hey, I'm going to go grab a, I'm going to go for a walk? Or did you just kind of move that way? Okay. Um, it's an interesting detail. So... I'm okay. I do remember having to make a decision. I was like, do I go? Le-? It was literally like a left or right thing. Okay. And I don't, I don't know what kind of podcast this is. Ex- well, exactly. Um, but I literally, like, I wanted to have a smoke. And like, it wasn't cigarettes. It was oh, yeah. No, this is <laughs> <You know>? fine. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the record, Bali had shared with Ted the reason he originally headed to the cliff that day. He had also explained to Ted about this overwhelming urge to climb the cliff. And after talking with Bale, I completely get his explanation. I mean, it was odd that Bale was in such a rush, blowing past the couple, taking the picture and all that. I can attest from the time I've been speaking with Bale that he's extremely polite, more so than most people. On top of that, he pretty much defines what it means to be calm and just chilled out. This need to rush to the top of the cliff didn't match Bale's character at all. I admit, maybe I just want to believe in a little magic. However, the fact is, at the end of the day, I most likely would not be here to tell you this story if Bali had made just one choice differently, especially the choice of grabbing a smoke. I do realize that was just the trigger to smoke, you know what I mean? Because I didn't have a smoke. (laughs) After all, I didn't get up to have a smoke. I got up to go do something else. I just didn't know it. (laughs) You must have really needed one by the end of the day. (laughs) Um... And so, yeah, I just, I was like, okay, am I going to go left or am I going to go right? And I was like, okay, I'm going to go right. And when I decided to go right, I went right without hesitation and without diverging. You know, had I stalled 30 seconds, one minute, I may not have even seen them or been in a position to be able to help them. I just happened to climb up at that moment. I literally just started climbing along the rocks following them because they were being pulled parallel to the west side of the island, away from the beach. The waves were a little bit big that day, so 
while they're being pulled sideways, the waves are also pushing them against the rocks and into the rocks, which is battering, you know? As soon as I get up there and I see them, I actually yelled out to them. I was like, are you guys okay? Um, and obviously they didn't even hear me. They were just struggling to try to go back the other way. My only goals became to try and get a breath of air again. That was the only thing I had going for me is I was gonna have a chance to, as long as I had my boogie board, I would have a chance to get the, uh, get a breath of air. And people say, did you have, did you pray? No, you don't, I didn't have time to pray. I didn't even, I, I had four grand, I had two grandchildren then. I didn't have time to think about any of that. I was just, my next goal was my breath of air. Once it started happening, I don't really have a concept of how much time elapsed, but it, everything happened so fast. I got down to the water um, and I got down to spend Hill Madison first. And I was literally like on top of a rock, like reaching out to him to help pull him up. Um, and he was bobbing up and down in the, in the water, but he couldn't, for some reason I didn't know at the time, um, he wasn't like, he was still alive, I can see, but he, when I called, when I reached out to him, he wasn't responsive to reach back. Though Bali didn't understand why Sven wasn't reaching back, he did know they didn't have a lot of time. He also felt like if he went in after Mr. Madsen, he wouldn't be able to get both himself and Sven back out. He was a big guy, um, and so what I imagined was a millisecond. I had the thought about getting in the water to help him, and my logic said, no way, that's not a good idea, because I knew that with how rough the water was and how big he was. I probably wouldn't be able to help him from in the water. What Ted and Vale didn't know then was that Mr. Madsen was having a seizure caused by the adrenaline and excitement. They found out later that seizures were something Mr. Madsen had experienced on and off throughout his life. This particular seizure had made Mr. Madsen very still and unable to move. You know, it, it was really like, I have to say one of the most profound experiences in my life because we had never met before and I did, like we made eye contact and I think, I, you know, I don't think I know I was the last person that he literally had human contact with. And for someone I had never met before and will never you know, meet again, you know, on this time, I, I'm just like, it was so, um, you know, it, I feel like I saw his soul, you know what I mean? We saw each other's soul in that moment. As soon as Bale realized he wasn't going to be able to help Mr. Madsen, he turned to see if he could help Ted. And so if you can imagine, you know, Ted was further ahead in the current, which is why I got to send first, because he was behind Ted. Uh, obviously, he didn't see me coming. He didn't know I was coming. Um, and so I think it was a great surprise to him when he saw me there, um, reaching out to him. And then, so the one time I come to the surface, where nobody in their right mind should be, who was Bali Shabaka reaching out. Um, and I remember the water, you know, the, ocean, the water was swelling up and down because it was, the waves were kind of big. And that was an area you, swimming made no difference. I mean, you were in trouble if you were in that turmoil. I initially tried to help him and then the water swelled down. The first try, he grabs me by the fingertips. If just for about two seconds, I feel another person, you know, and now he just has to let me go. He was afraid I was going to yank him in. I remember, like, I didn't really have any fear of anything, although I knew that, you know, in, some of the rocks are jagged. There are sea urchins and whatnot. There's sea moss, so some parts are slippery. I had on no shoes, and and I remember where I was standing. It definitely felt a little slick, but I just maintained a firm standing. Now I'm sucked down underneath, and I don't have my boogie board. And I'm just swirling down there. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, yes, I do have my boogie board. It was Velcro strapped on, and I literally was pulling on the rope and got to my board underwater, and then it brought me back into the same sequence that I was in. And I was coming back to the same spot, and he tried again, but now we're down. We don't know if it was three tries or four between us. We just can't remember. But he, he finally gets me, so he's grabbing onto my wrist area, and I'm grabbing his wrist area, and that's a bigger hold. And he manages his way, he straddles me out on a pillar rock, just out from him. 
And I was like, okay, the next time the water falls, like, I'm going to use it to help you get up and help me pull you up. I mean, I am just totally exhausted. I have over 100 sea urchin spines stuck in my feet and my legs and my body, and mine are in the big picture here. And he says, the next wave's going to lift you before it takes you. Get ready. Here it comes. Because my back's turned to it, see? And here it came, and he's screaming, now. The wave swelled up against the rock. Or I managed to get my toes in the crevice and lift with it at the right time. That's when I successfully got him out of the water. He got me up onto the little ledge that he was on, no more than about two feet wide. And I'm just laying there face down. And in a few moments, I managed to turn over and I looked up at him and I said in a calm voice, I don't know if you're gonna like me or not, but you're my friend for life. The terrain was too rough for Bali to get Ted back over the beach by himself. And so he left Ted and went back for help again. And I remember when I got to about the point where I had initially seen them, there were two snorkelers in the water. The men in the water happened to be doctors from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Both Bale and Ted shouted over to them. And I, I, I yelled at them. I was like, you guys, like, swim out to this guy because um, Sven had at that point, like, he was just started to float, like, out. And Mr. Matson was floating on his back. So both Bali and myself were hopeful that he was in survival mode, just trying to save his energy, you know, breathe that way. I, I said, he's over there. And I managed to get enough strength to stand up again and point. And so as soon as I got there, the suit snorkelers heard me, and they, they both had a, their snorkel gear under flippers, so they both immediately swam out to where Sven was. And the one guy, he sees him, and just as he gets to him, Mr. Matson rolls over and sinks. Down goes this doctor and brings him up. He's got flippers on and this and that, so he's able to control, and he's not in that certain current. He got him and was dragging him back around the point and back to the beach. As soon as the doctors got Mr. Madsen ashore, they started CPR. In the meantime, a group of four other men went back with Bale to help Ted over the cliffs and onto the beach. Finally, we work our way up the top of the cliff, and they were both Iowa doctors were holding me by the elbows at the time, and it was a good thing because I had a real, another shock hit me. Down below, laying on the beach, was the body of Mr. Matson covered with a hotel sheet. And talk about a kick in the stomach when the real reality hits you. It was probably, their whole, I collapsed. They're holding me up, and then finally, after about 30 seconds, I, I said to myself, Ted, you have got to get your act together here. We've got to do this. And I jump out onto the beach on all fours, and I was back. As the doctors from Iowa and Bale helped Ted up, Ted started to realize that a large group of people was gathering around him and pointing. He could hear them calling him a hero. About 80 to 100 people, I don't know how many, all come swarming up and they're all yelling the same thing. You know, and I'm, I said, no, no, you're mistaken. I pointed at him. He's right there. He tried saving me. They all got quiet. And they're looking off to the side, and about 20 feet to my left, standing by herself, was the widow looking at me. And when her eyes met, she reached out in the universal look of, let's hug. I needed a hug. And I went up to her, and we hugged, and I said, I'm so sorry this has happened. She squeezes me, she steps back, she floors everybody in her broken English. He, she points at him, he was a macho man, but he was not 20 anymore. He was 70. At that point, I, I think I kind of stepped away and wasn't like close to the, to the whole situation. I kind of just stepped away and became very emotional. I just couldn't hold it together anymore. I just decided to go home. Me being there wasn't relevant anymore. I went back to my chair to get my stuff. And now here comes the, his body being carried to the morgue truck. She's following behind the body. 
she's with 30 people. And she walked, they went by me about five feet away. I just mouthed the words, I love you to her, you know, for just the way she had reacted. She could have jumped all over me screaming and beat on me or, you know, she was totally, she just knew this is something that he would do anywhere for anybody. I asked Balahe and Ted what things were like for each of them after it all happened. In Ted's case, he actually went to Mr. Madsen's funeral. He spent several days getting to know not just the family, but the man who died trying to save his life. Savannah Hill Matson was a former retired teacher. Well, I was a retired teacher. He was on their city council, and I was on a city council. I talk about the wonderful Danes. The people are amazing people. Everything is just, they were just so kind, so kind. The family was just making sure they they did everything they could that wouldn't feel guilty that I was coming back stateside a better man. Over the first couple of years, um, I think I really had like a, a guilt factor that I didn't save him too. It's so interesting because there have been times when I've seen old men who somewhat resemble him, and it, it reminds me of him, <laughs> um, particularly older um, Scandinavian men, <laughs> you know. Um, and so it definitely jogs memory when I see older men who, who somewhat resemble him. But over the years, I think I've come to acceptance of the fact that, you know, everything happens the way it's meant to happen. Um, and I, I genuinely believe that. Because Mr. Madsen was from Denmark, the story was picked up all around the world by major networks, both in the U.S. and in Europe. A St. Croix newspaper ran an article titled Humbled Hero. When they asked me about it, I was like, you know, I, I don't feel better today anything that anyone else would not have done had they been in that position. Um, but there was something that disappointed me in the way I saw the, the story being represented um, throughout the mainstream media. Only because when you look at any type of horrible act that's being committed by um, a young a young black man or a woman, those things are on the headlines in the most abrupt way that they can be. And here it was, uh, myself being this man of African descent, and this story has the potential to you know, help quell some you know racial tensions in America. And I felt as though the story didn't represent it within the capacity that it could have for the good that it could have done. I'm not like seeking any recognition, but at the same time, it's not about me. It's about the story and it's about it being represented in a factual way that lets people see the essence of the story, the connection that we have with each other and um, the empathy that we share of the positivity of the story, you know, for that purpose. What Bali had to say made me stop and think from a different perspective, from his perspective, from a non-white perspective. I found it humbling that instead of wanting credit for himself, Bali was more interested in having his actions represent his race in a positive light. After hearing everything told from both Ted and Bali, it was obvious how each of them was forever changed by these moments they experienced together. Yeah, I am a different person to this day, I think. I I check myself a lot, especially I find myself not flipping the bird at somebody pulling out in front of me, that kind of thing, or even calling them names. I I say, I say, oh, you're a fool. You know what else I could have said? And really, I refrain from trying to swear. Just everything's so much more brilliant to me. Just everything, just flying birds. I have such compassion towards little things, little animals, little... I mean, I see a bug crawling across the floor. I don't stomp on it. I get a piece of paper and let it crawl on, take it outside. I'm really, I'm going, I'm here, I'm back. I'm going to, I've made it. I have lived through this. I lived through this. Life, I'm alive. No, I, I genuinely, genuinely believe it wasn't an accident that I walked up there at that moment. I think it definitely makes me appreciate connections with people more. You know, life is fleeting. You know, life is not permanent, and we are all here to learn our lessons and also to share that experience and be a part of other people's experiences and 
you know, because every little thing we do has a huge ripple effect, whether we know it or not. And so I think it makes me live my life with more intent, even if we don't see the, the string of events that led to that effect. They're just invisible to our perception, but there were a string of events that led to that very moment. A few weeks after recording, I reached out to follow up with Ted. What I learned was shocking. Ted had died. He had had a heart attack. He died September 10th, 2019. He was 68 years old. The men in this story continue to remind me about the good in people and how our time on Earth is made special by the moments we share with each other. They remind me how fleeting life can be and how truly important it is to live in the moment. This episode of Shadow Clock was created by me. Editing notes provided by Adam Gould. Our post audio editor is Josh Kobach. Additional post production audio is by Matt Saro. Social media is managed by Alec Jansen and Kelsey Hayes. Music is credited to Pond5 and Premium Beat. Content contributors, composers, and individual song titles for each episode can be found on our website at shadow clock.com. Kate Cosgrove creates original illustrations for each episode of Shadow Clock, which you can also see at shadow-clock.com. If you like the show, you can spread the word by telling someone else about Shadow Clock and, of course, by following us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook at Shadow Clock Podcast, on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Shadow Clock Pod, and on YouTube at Shadow Clock. I personally want to express just how much it means every time you give us a click, a like, a subscribe, or follow. And we love word of mouth endorsements. Your support means the world, and I can't thank each and every one of you enough. Speaking of thanks, a special thanks goes out to Janet Griffiths, Cindy Mahalik, Adam Gould, Alec Jansen, Kate Cosgrove, Alejandro Velas, Josh Kobach, Matt Saro, Johnny Messina, Bruce Sively, Adam Zavislak, Austin Krieg, Forest Hills Northern High School in Michigan, Duro Howard, Aaron Frank, Benny DeCatano, and Kelsey Hayes. This is also a good time to give a shout out and thank you to our guest, Bali Shabaka Kaza Amla who is also a musician and artist. We've included links to his music on our website. Bale, you were one of our first interviews. Thank you for all your time and patience waiting for this episode to drop and for sharing your life perspectives with me during our various conversations. I learn something every time we talk. To Mr. Matson's wife and family, I want you to know that when I heard this story from Bale and Ted, that your loss was never lost on me. I can only imagine the heartache you've experienced with Sven's loss. And I want you to know that I think of your family and Mr. Matson often. To Ted Wallace's family, please know that I'm so thankful to Ted for sharing his experience with me. I was so sorry to hear about his passing after we recorded this episode, and I wanted you to know I've been truly moved by his story. I hope this episode is told in a way that captures each man's greatness. I'm Katie Mahalik, and this is Shadow Clock.